Linda Dixon from the Lexington Veterans Association. Thank you for joining us for another Zoom presentation of another excellent program with a military focus. I am joined by my co-hosts, Bob Lewis, who is on the screen right now, at least he's on my screen, um, who is our program chair, and Jim Ramsey, who is our indomitable producer. Now, at this point in the program, we usually, we stand, we open our program with the Pledge of Allegiance, and we're going to do that now, if it's okay with everybody. If you're able to stand, please do, and Captain Bob Lewis, U.S. Navy retired, will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. All set, Bob? All set. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> now, for some brief announcements. Uh, we have some very special guests with us today. They are descendants of the original crew of the USS Indianapolis. They learned of this program and they reached out to us and they come from all over the country uh, to, uh, to make sure they were invited to this program. So I'd like to just, I will introduce the ones we know about. There might be others in the audience who have joined us at the last minute and we won't, uh, and, and, and by all means, you know, identify yourself. So first we have from New Orleans, Louisiana, Maria Eck Bullard. Um, Maria is the daughter of Harold Eck, seaman second class, who fortunately survived the sinking. Now, Maria is the chair of the USS Indianapolis Second Watch organization, which is an association of descendants of the ship. We have Andrew Bitanti from St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Andrew is the son of Seaman First Class Louis Bitanti, also a survivor. Welcome to Julie Haas from Mascouta, Illinois. Now, Julie's uncle was not so fortunate. He was Robert A. Rutherford, radioman, petty officer, second class, and he perished at sea after participating in all 10 prior battles that the Indianapolis was engaged in. Welcome to Ann Jackson of Shelbyville, Indiana. Anne's father was Robert, now I hope I'm pronouncing this right, I would think it would be Bogman, Radioman Petty Officer, second class. Now he was transferred off the ship before it sank, but he served almost the entire war aboard the Indianapolis. Welcome to Brooke Wax, I hope that's the right pronunciation, from Kentucky. And she is the daughter of Joseph Van Meter, who was, is, am I right? Yes, who was a water tender, petty officer, third class. And we've just, in the last few minutes, been joined by two more we know about, Helen Neal O'Connor, whose uncle, Charles Keith Neal, was a survivor, and Norma Weibel, who is the daughter of Joseph Krauss. And in addition to all of these guests who reached out to us, our speaker, Bob Began, reached out to a particular uh, person. We, we've been chatting with her, and her name is Libby Ostrovsky. And she's going to join Bob 
in his presentation. Libby's father, Captain Lewis Haynes, served as chief medical officer on board the doomed ship. And he spent four and a half days in the water before being rescued. So we, we're so pleased to welcome all of you. And as we said, you are now <laughs> muted, but when we come to the question and answer, if anyone wants to direct a question in their, in their direction, we can accommodate you. Now, hey, Linda? Yes, sir. Linda? Excuse the interruption. I'm just, I noticed that there are a couple of raised hands. Uh, would you like to entertain questions or ask them to hold on to that? Oh, sure. I see Norma is, and, and Norma is one of our survivors. So is that an old one or by all means? I, I think it's new. I think it's new. I assume it's new. So I'm going to unmute so, her. And there's also a William yeah. Michael. Uh, yeah, Michael by all means. Sure. No, I was, I, it was an old question. Uh, or an old raising of the hand, um, and but I do want to say that my father was Joseph Klaus, K L A U S. Oh, I said Kraus. It's Klaus. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Glad you corrected. It's okay. it's now we have Michael yeah, Michael you. William Emery, uh, who Hi, has everyone. been unmuted. Michael. Hi everyone. Just want to introduce myself. Uh, live in Concord, Mass. I've met Bob before. Bob was nice enough to enjoy, to invite me to one of his presentations. Uh, I am the nephew and namesake of William Friend Emery, Seaman First Class, Quartermaster Striker, Navigation Division, USS Indianapolis, Missing in Action, Lost at Sea, Gone But Never Forgotten. Uh, I'm here today just to support Bob. I want to say hello to all my indie family, and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Well, that's marvelous. Thank you so much. I love your shirt. Thank you very much. I call this my tribute shirt. Some people call it my uniform. Uh, but anything I can do to acknowledge my beloved uncle and namesake, uh, I'm honored to do so. Oh, that's super. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. And who knows, more people may pop up. Um, all right, looking ahead, let me just see what our time is. We're fine. Looking ahead to next month, um, we have a program planned for Monday. August 10th, Alex Kane, author, educator, historian, member of the Lexington Minutemen, will talk about Lexington just before the Revolutionary War. And he will describe how Lexington, the sleepy farm village, became a hotbed of the American Revolution and had a great deal to do with encouraging the the Massachusetts folks to um, revolt. We will also resume our regular program schedule in September, but for the rest of the year, we're going to do it by Zoom. We, we're just putting the finishing touches on our fall schedule and you will receive it shortly. Now, just a quick update on a memo that you, many of you received uh, a few days ago pointing out the need for blank audiobook cartridges at the Bedford VA Hospital. Because of COVID, the veterans in long-term care are more isolated than ever. And listening to audiobooks is something they can do to pass the time and to be informed. Now, normally the library volunteers deliver these cassettes to the veterans and then they collect them and give them to somebody else. They can't do that now. And so they need a continuing supply of blank cartridges. The library volunteers then take the audiobooks, copy them onto the blank cartridges. So we think that donating some new blank cartridges is a way for the Lexington Veterans Association to do something really useful and helpful. It's simple and it's affordable. So we encourage everyone to consider donating one or more blank cartridges. Instructions are included in the memo that 98% of you received, but if you need assistance, then I'm I'm just going to give you right now Jim Ramsey's email address. If you write to Jim, he will tell you everything you need to know 
about the cartridges. And uh, we don't have a slide, so I'm just going to give it to you. It's pretty simple. It's uh, James Rams, J-A-M-E-S-R-A-M-S, -E at Verizon.net. Okay, we have a few minutes remaining before we start the YouTube portion of the program. And if anyone in the audience has an announcement or just something they would like to share with the rest of us, please identify yourself. And uh, we have time for, you know, a couple of announcements if, if there are any. Okay. Okay, I don't believe so, right, Jim? I don't, I don't see a raised hand, uh, Linda. All right, cool. Well, now I'm going to open the program formally for the part that will be loaded onto YouTube. So uh, I'm gonna start all over again, all right? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Linda Dixon from the Lexington Veterans Association and I'm happy to welcome you today to a presentation on the tragedy of the USS Indianapolis. We extend a warm welcome to our fellow veterans at the Edith Norse Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital in nearby Bedford, Massachusetts, who may be watching this live. And we are honored to have with us a number of descendants of the crew members of the Indianapolis. And to introduce our speaker, Bob Began, I would like to call on another Bob, Bob Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. The USS Indianapolis was the pride of the United States Navy. She was President Roosevelt's favorite ship and his ship of state and the flagship of the Fifth Fleet. The Indianapolis was known as a lucky ship because she had emerged unscathed from numerous naval encounters during the war in the Pacific. Her luck changed on July 30th, 1945, when, after delivering the atomic bomb to the island of Tinian, yeah. the USS Indianapolis was struck by two Japanese torpedoes and sank in 12 minutes. 900 men went into the water. Four days later, when they were finally rescued, only 300 survived. Our speaker, Bob Began, grew up in Maine and has a lifelong interest in naval history. Although he had plans to join the Navy, he was drafted into the Army after his graduation from Babson College and served during the Vietnam era. Afterwards, he had a 35-year career with St. Regis Paper, holding a variety of management positions, rising to logistics manager. Now in retirement, Bob can spend time researching and preparing talks on his favorite subject. Bob is accompanied today by Libby Ostrovsky, the daughter of Captain Lewis Haynes, who survived as chief medical officer on the USS Indianapolis and survived four and a half days in the water. Please welcome Bob Began. Bob. Might be muted. Let me unmute him. Oh, yeah, I think so. I, is that there? We go. Is that good? That's better. Okay. Hit share <laughs> screen, Jim. Yes, Bob. Hit share screen, and you should see your presentation there. Uh, it says host disable participant screen sharing. Do I hit OK? Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait just a minute. I'm sorry, just a minute. Sure. Uh, let's see, uh, 
So you're listed here as Bob. I want to make sure I got the right Bob. We got a couple of Bobs. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought I. Uh, no problem. Uh, let's see. So Bob. <coughs> Um, <clears throat> no, wait, I'm sorry, Bob, I'm, uh, just a second. Yeah, no problem. Okay. I, I thought I had made you a co-host. Uh, now you're a co-host, so you should be able to share your screen. So I'll hit share screen. Yep. Uh, it just says host disabled participant screen sharing. Should I put OK? okay. I, I may have. Uh, no, I, I labeled you. Just a minute. Oh, uh, I. I uh, OK, just a minute. The, we we have a couple of bobs here, which is the problem. I I've now, I think I've now got the right bob, so you should be able to share your screen. Bingo. I'm sorry about that, Bob, but there you go. Right. You did it. Well, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, one other comment, Jim. On the right, the, uh, the 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 there's three participants here. If I hit that one block, that'll block them out, right? Yeah, I'll hit that little uh, yep. horizontal bar there. there. There we go. All right, what a country! <laughs> <laughs> you know, talk about ladies and gentlemen. Talk about teaching an old dog new tricks. I'll tell you. Thank heavens for this august group from Lexington who's managing to work with me. Uh, the story of the U.S. is Indianapolis. This is, uh, you know, this is not one story. This particular story is the story of uh, 1,196 men plus men who served on her at other times and a valiant ship. It, it's, this is probably one of the most powerful stories I've, I've ever dealt with. Indianapolis. She was launched November the 7th, 1931 from the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in Camden. She was commissioned November 15th at the Philadelphia Navy Yard in 1932. Incidentally, America was still in prohibition at that time, so instead of a bottle of champagne across her bow, she had a bottle of water from two rivers in Indian Indianapolis. For a cost of about $11 million, the Navy gets a ship 610 feet long, 66 foot beam, and she displaces about 11,000 tons. Her primary armament is nine uh, eight inch guns mounted in two turrets forward and one turret aft. She also has a secondary armament of five inch guns, and she's gonna carry five scout planes who could be launched from her catapults. They would fly ahead. They would guide the aim of the Indies gunners. They would search for the enemy. They would do rescue work. All of this is before radar. So that, you know, these would be the eyes of the ship. She had eight boilers. They could propel her four shafts at a maximum speed of 32 knots. She is and was a very fast ship. At her commissioning, her crew consisted of 906 men and 46 officers. She also had extra accommodations to serve as a flagship for admirals and high-ranking officers. And obviously, one of the highest ranking would be the President of the United States. Roosevelt loved the Indianapolis. He took her on a cruise uh, to South America he always had a fond spot for the Indy. She spent her peacetime years in both the Atlantic and the Pacific 
She had sailed throughout the world showing the flag. Here she is. This is a, uh, a, a picture of her. She's painted gray. This is her wartime configuration. And you can see the main guns forward. In the middle of the ship, you can see the uh, hangars with the aircraft. Further aft are any aircraft guns. Here's a picture of her in peacetime. <clears throat> and if you, it's hard to make out, but very, very near the end, below the uh, the rear mast, you can see some huge boats. These were wooden, uh, these were wooden boats. They were the captain's boat. They were the uh, uh, just general purpose boats. At the beginning of the war, American warships tended to have a lot of wooden lifeboats. Well, one of the things they learned early in the war was that many of the ships were lost, not because of watertight integrity loss, but because of fires which had no, they couldn't control. So as the war goes on, these wooden lifeboats are more and more and more replaced by life rafts and life jackets and, and uh, floater nets. Uh, here's another picture. The, you can see them in the, uh, in the back of the, uh, just by the aft mast. This is one of the last pictures of her taken during peacetime. Once the war broke out, she's in the Pacific. She's going to see combat in the Aleutians, the Gilberts, the Marshall Islands, the Marianas, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. And through all of these engagements, 42, 43, 44, and well into 1945, she's a lucky ship. Not one man lost in action. Well, March 31st, 1945, off the coast of o Okinawa, she gets hit by a bomb from a Japanese bomber. The bomb hits aft on the port, port side, plummets through several decks. Nine men are killed, damage to the hull, damage to the birthing area, the mess hall, the fuel tanks. Two of her four propeller shafts are knocked out. She's taken out of, uh, out of action, and she has to go back to the West Coast to be repaired and refit. Here she is, she's in the uh, San Francisco Navy Yard. She's at Mare Island. She's being, uh, she's being refitted, uh, repaired. Whenever a ship was repaired or modified with new equipment or new capabilities, the Navy Department would always take photographs and they would circle the changes made. And this would indicate the, 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 uh, the changes made during the refit. Up top, and you've seen the various radar installations and, and communication equipment. These are all upgraded. Up forward here, uh, forward in front of number one turret, you'll see additional anti-aircraft guns. So she's getting she's getting modified. Uh, they're incorporating the lessons learned so far. Here's another picture, close up. Now, note on the gun turret, uh, they have these life rafts. There's life rafts on the side. Uh, in the uh, superstructure headed near the hangar in the back, there are, these life rafts are everywhere because they're going to be a prime mean of escape for the men. <clears throat> it's 1945, it's July, people are thinking, you know what, maybe this thing's going to be over. We might not have to go back. We might miss it. You know, maybe it's just we're just about there, maybe we can avoid going back. Well, that changed. July 12th, 75 years ago yesterday, Captain McVeigh, her commanding officer, he learns of a special top secret mission. He is to take his ship with a secret cargo that nobody is to be aware of. This cargo is to be guarded night and day. No unauthorized personnel are gonna have access with it. If the ship sinks, this cargo is to have top priority to be rescued. Now, here's Captain McVeigh, Annapolis, dedicated officer, well respected, not the toughest guy in the fleet, but, but, a, but a good commanding officer. These are his officers. The entire commissioned uh, offices are in front. 
I just want to show you these pictures before we get into the, uh, the nature of the mission. These are real guys. These are regular people, their fathers, their sons, their brothers. This is Lieutenant Commander Lewis Haynes. He is the senior medical officer on board, a dedicated physician. Here's Lieutenant Commander Haynes in the middle. These two men are fellow officers. This was taken uh, at, on the island of Ulithi uh, during an R&R &R break. They're enjoying, a, they're enjoying some time away from the front. Lieutenant Redman. He's the engineering officer. Here's Lieutenant Commander Haynes to the left. And you can see these men, most of these men are, are, are warrant officers. Uh, again, picture of health, having a beer, just relaxing. They're enjoying life. A little higher up on the food chain, these are the key players. To the left, Admiral Spruance. He's in charge of the uh, Fifth Fleet. Very, very capable, uh, just a top shelf officer. The man next to him is Ernest King. In the American Navy, there is nobody in a higher position of authority than him. King is tough. He does not suffer fools lightly. He is extremely pragmatic. Uh, he's the guy you want at the top. Next is Admiral Limits. Nimitz, uh, again, another dedicated, capable officer. And the man to the right is a Brigadier General, I forget his name, but he, I think he was basically catching a ride. Here she is. She's firing uh, on board, she's firing at Saipan. This is the invasion of Saipan. Uh, that was one of the bloody invasions, but we, we finally ended up taking the island. So she's uh, supporting the landing and she's firing at shore targets. Here's another picture of her and that splash, there were two splashes that shows you how close the Japanese fire came to her. All right, back to the top secret mission. Here she is. This is the atomic bomb. This is what the Indianapolis is charged with delivering. The charge is ultimately to bring her to the island of Tinian. Tinian was a huge air base primarily used by B-29s uh, in their attacks to, uh, on the Japanese homeland. The decision to make the bomb, or the decision to use the bomb, basically goes back to March of 1945. We had been bombing the Japanese homeland consistently. There were high altitude bombing missions. The decision was made Let's go to low level and let's go to a highly incendiary bombing. On the night of March 9th and 10th, 334 B-29s hit Tokyo. They caused the largest fire in history, in the history of the world, leaving 83,000 dead and as many as 1 million people homeless. For the next three months, these raids continued. Nagoya, Osaka, Kobe, all of these cities. Bombing raids were, at, they were a daily event. And still, there was no sign of the Japanese coming to the table. There was no sign of them weakening. There was no sign of them wanting to surrender. So the decision is made, let's use the bomb. One of the factors in that decision was they estimated that there were 1 million Japanese soldiers ready to defend Japan in addition to the countless civilian members who were prepared to die. So they make the decision to, uh, to use the bomb, to deliver the bomb. <clears throat> July 16th, eight o'clock in the morning, she departs Indianapolis. The Indianapolis de departs, the, she clears the Golden Gate Bridge. She's headed for Pearl Harbor, then ultimately to Tinian Island. After three days at flank speed, Diamond Head was sighted. This set a record of 2,091 miles in 75 hours. That still stands for a speed record. A lot of the crew were thrilled. Ah, Pearl Harbor, Diamond Head, Honolulu, they're gonna have fun, they're gonna go on leave. No way. She is allowed to stay in Diamond, in uh, Pearl, she's allowed to stay in uh, 
Diamond Head for six hours. She'll take on more fuel and provisions. She will then leave and head for Kenya. Well, also on July 16th, another ship departs on a war cruise, and it's a Japanese submarine. It is the I-58. She's going to leave from Kure, Japan, on patrol. She's going to be in the seas adjacent to the Allied shipping routes to the Philippines. She's one of the last functional submarines in Japan's Navy. She's a little bit bigger than her counterpart, her American counterpart. Overall length, 600, 355 feet. She carries six torpedo tubes, all forward, as well as six Catons. The Catons are actually manned torpedoes, which are on the, on the top of the submarine. There are six of them. They are the underwater version of the kamikaze. The word Katen comes from the Chinese, meaning revolving the heavens. Well, the Japanese took and twisted that interpretation to mean turning the tide. This is going to turn the tide against the American fleet. Here's her commander. 36-year-old year Lieutenant Commander Mochusura Hashimoto, career officer, trains his crew constantly, well respected by the men. By this time of the war, Japan's glory days are over. 1941-42 were the peak years for the Japanese Navy. But they still did not give up. And Hashimoto is thrilled that he has a chance to bring this submarine to attack some of the American communication lines. They're not going after Amer the mighty fleet. They're just going to try to hinder things. This is what is called the Long Lance Torpedo. It's a Type 95. If the Japanese Navy did one thing right during World War II, it was the development and the utilization of their torpedoes. Their torpedoes were effective from underwater as well as from surface ships. She's 23 feet, five inches long, weight 3,600 pounds. The warhead is 890 to 1,200 pounds. This torpedo can go anywhere from 9,800 yards to 13,000 yards. Speed, 49 to 51 knots. This is a highly, highly effective weapon. A little bit of geography lesson here. The Pacific Ocean is so huge, it was divided up into uh, geographic areas. The, in the little box here, you see Guam at the bottom, and then you see Titanian, and then you see Saipan. Those are the Mariana Islands. That is considered the Mariana Sea Frontier. Over to the left are the Philippine Islands, this command zone is the Philippine Sea frontier. So you had different jurisdictions, not only amongst the Japanese, but amongst the American, uh, among the American fleet. July 23rd, Indianapolis is en route to Tinian. On that day, a top secret ultra message was sent to 11 different Pacific commands. It told about the details, the sightings, and the activities of Japanese submarines, including the sinking of one submarine in the vicinity of the Caroline Islands and the Marianas. That's in the central Philippine Sea. These messages, top secret altar, it went to 11 different Pacific commands. It's telling everybody in various command zones about activity in this area. The next day, July 24th, the Underhill, it's a United States destroyer, the USS Underhill is sunk by a Japanese submarine. She loses 112 men and she sinks in the vicinity of the Allied shipping route to the Philippines. Now basically, Kinian is on the far right, the Philippines are on the left. 
Four days later, July 28th, a merchant ship is headed north. Her name, the, the ship is the Wild Hunter. She sights a periscope about 75 miles south of the route to the Philippines from Guam. Calls the destroyer escort. The, the destroyer escort pursues the sub for six hours, but she loses contact. The destroyer escort is the Albert Harris. She transmits a report which generates an urgent secret, secret message from the Philippine sea frontier to Guam. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this area of the Mariana Islands and the Philippine Sea. Meanwhile, July 26th, the Indianapolis arrives at Tinian. She unloads the bomb and she receives orders stating, upon completion of unloading at Tinian, go to Guam, report to the port director for routing to Leyte for 10 days of training with Task Force 95.7. These messages that are sent go to two classes of receipts. There's one group that's considered action. And that means if you get this memo, if you get this message, you're expected to take action. The other classification was information or interest, meaning uh, you don't have to take action. It's for you. It's for information, but we don't expect you to do anything. And that's aimed at the higher ranking officers. So there's a lot of communication going back and forth, talking about submarines, talking about activity. July 27th, the Indianapolis has left Tinian. She's dropped the bomb off. She's gone to Guam. That's where she's supposed to go to get her her routing orders. Guam was a major, major focal point for ships tra uh, traveling west to the Philippines. <laughs> Captain McVeigh reports to the routing officer, Commodore James Carter. And he's, he's, he says, you know, how, how are things going here? What's going on? I haven't been out in this area, you know, tell me what's going on. Uh, the routing officer goes, you know what? Things are very quiet. The Japs are on their last leg. There's really nothing to worry about. There's no mention of the Underhill sinking. There's no mention of the Wild Hunter events. Instead, McVeigh is instructed to take route PD, P-E-D-D-I-E. -D -D it's a route, it's almost a straight shot of 1,100 miles from Guam to Leyte through the Philippine Sea. Now, <clears throat> his rate of speed is calculated to be 15.7 knots. That's the fastest he is supposed to go. And that is a result of a policy that if your ship was not considered to be in a dangerous area or a combat zone, you could not exceed 16, maybe 17 knots. You had to stay under the 17 knot threshold because the Navy's appetite for fuel was insatious. So this was a, like a, a, this was a policy to save save fuel. At that speed, he's going to arrive at 8 a.m. on July 31st. Okay. McVeigh is still a little, a little concerned over the fact that he's, he doesn't, I don't know, he just says, hey, can, I'd feel better if I, can, can I get an escort? Can I get a, a destroyer or two? The answer, no, uh, we don't have any. And even if we did, you don't need one. There's really nothing to worry about. And, he, and he's, he's given this message numerous times. Now his orders state, sometime on July 30th, the Indianapolis will, will cross the chop line from one command to the other. Basically what it's saying is, sometime on the 30th, he'll shift from the Mariana, Mariana Islands command zone to the Philippine Sea command zone. So the <laughs> Mariana guys will drop them, the Philippine Sea people will pick them up. July 28th, she weighs anchor and she's headed for Guam, 9 a.m. At that time, there are messages sent to the Philippines indicating her departure as well as her estimated ETA. She's left Guam 9 a.m. on the 28th, 15.7 knots, expected to be in Leyte at 11 a.m. on the 31st. Noontime, July 29th, 
she sets sights another vessel. It's an LST. It's headed north. This is the last friendly vessel she will see. 6 p.m. The seas are turning choppy and rough. Visibility's fair. Officer of the deck with Lieutenant Junior Grade Charles McKissick. He reads the Wild Hunter message, which reported contact with an enemy submarine the day before at a position 75 miles south of the Indianapolis's projected position the next day. In the officer's wardroom, reference was made to a Jap sub intercepting us about midnight. Jokingly, a reply of, oh well, our destroyers will take care of that. 8 p.m., rough seas, long swells, low heavy clouds, occasional glimpse of the pale moon. Captain McVeigh issues orders to cease zigzagging. Below decks, the temperature is well above 95 degrees. The engine room is 120 degrees. Many hatches and doors are left open. Topside is full of men. They figure at least 300 men trying to avoid the heat. Our topside something. But that doesn't mean nobody's on lookout duty. There were at least 22 men scanning the horizons. 11 p.m., McVeigh retires to his cabin. He leaves orders for the officer of the day to wake him if there are any changes in the weather or sea conditions. On board the I-58, Lieutenant Commander Hashimoto raises periscope. He's looking for a target, doesn't see any surfaces to get a better view. Suddenly, a ship is spotted some six miles distant. I-58 dives at once. Hashimoto plots the speed of Indianapolis at 12 knots, distance of 1,500 meters. He orders six torpedoes ready for firing at a speed of 48 knots, depth of 13 feet. At a little after midnight, 27 minutes after he sights the Indianapolis, the command of fire releases six torpedoes. It takes less than one minute for the first to hit the target. <laughs> The first torpedo hits just on the, it hits on the starboard side, just near the bow. It rips apart 65 feet of the bow from the bowsprit to just below the 20 millimeter guns. First torpedo hits below the 20 millimeter guns. All of a sudden, at once, a huge fire breaks out. It's fueled by 3,500 gallons of high octane aviation fuel stored in this area. The aviation fuel was for the five uh, planes she carries. Anybody below decks would have been killed instantly in this area. Sick bay, forward enlisted berthing, the marine berthing area, the ship's stewards quarters. One deck above, fires are raging throughout the officers' quarters. This wound was the result of the Type 95 torpedoes designed to inflict a mortal wound on capital ships. The first part of the blast, the first blast focuses on buckling the ship's skin and weakening her internal structure. A second explosion would blow a huge hole downward below the target. Once the displaced water surges upward back into the weakened hull, the shock wave could break the ship in half. With a torn portion of the bow askew, water is surging into the open compartments after frame number 12, drowning any personnel in this area. Second torpedo strikes at about frame 45, just, just below turret number two. This opens up the midships to flooding seas on the main deck and the second deck. All communications are lost. In the engine room number one, Generators have failed, killing all lights and ventilation. Steam pressure has dropped from uh, boiler room number one. The steam pressure dropped from 300 pounds per square inch to 75 pounds per square inch. All men in boiler room number one were killed instantly, most likely flash boiled. Topside, radio one and radio two are in shambles. Fires are raging throughout the ship. Wounded men below decks, they're trapped by flooding and toxic smoke. They're trapped by fire. They're trying to get, it's trying to go aft and they're trying to go topside. Uh, it's, it's total pandemonium. 
McVeigh, at, at the first, McVeigh thinks the ship might hold on. Within moments, he realizes she's lost. Men are dispatched to radio two. And the thing is, there is so much damage and fire raging, and nobody has a firm grasp on exactly what the situation is. McVeigh does not know for sure how bad things are. He sends runners to various areas, but there's no communication. This is a 600 foot long ship. This is a long area. And you know, if you have closed off by fire and, and incoming water and toxic smoke, you don't have a lot of time to discern what the hell is going on. Radio one and radio two are both damaged. He sends men to get an SOS off. This is always a source of controversy. Uh, they do get a message off. One, uh, one school of thought is they get it off. It didn't contain the ship's exact location. Again, there's, there's a little bit of confusion as to what was transmitted at that time. McVeigh finally giving the order to abandon ship. Word races through to the men aft and elsewhere. They're loosening floater rafts, life rafts, life jackets. All the while, the ship is listening to starboard. She's still going forward. She's still being propelled by uh, the other engine room. The engineering officer thinks, well, I'm going to jettison the fuel, and that might help stabilize the list. So all her fuel, which is thick, thick, sludgy bunker fuel, it has to be heated before it can be burned, is dumped onto the starboard side. And that's going to be a, a mistake because men are going to be jumping right into that. In less than 12 minutes after she's hit, the ship will roll over to starboard and with her stern raised high, sink in some of the deepest waters in the world. <laughs> this painting has nothing to do with the Indianapolis, but I wanted I wanted to include it. It's, it's done by a French painter in the 1800s. It's called The Wreck of the Medusa. And it, it shows the despair. It shows the anguish. It shows how some people still have hope. Some people are hoping for rescue. Others have simply given up. But that, I, I thought that would convey a little bit of the feeling of being in the water. Uh, there's an author named Doug Stanton. He wrote In Harm's Way, and I think I want to read a quote by him because I think it just is, hits it right on the head. <clears throat> there were no birds in the sky, no wind, only the lapping of the noxious stew of seawater and fuel oil against Capoc life vests. There were no stars, just the occasional flash of a crescent moon like a needle of bone threading its way through a flying curtain of cloud. At times, the exhausted boys floated in complete darkness, unable to discern any horizon at all, the sea rising and falling in heavy swells. At other moments, the boys were lit by a ghostly silver light. The living prayed out loud while the dying screamed. Depending on where you went overboard would dictate where you, what kind of group you might have ended up in. Remember, you're abandoning ship. You're not going in lifeboats. What you're gonna be wearing are these k -Park life jackets. Due to a requisition error, there were 2,500, more than twice the amount the normal complement would carry. So these life jackets are everywhere. These life rafts, you can see them, they're on top of the gun turrets. They're on the side. They're over here on the side of the superstructure. They are everywhere. There were 37 of them. On these life rafts, you can see, if you look closely in the front, are like two wooden kegs. They contain a certain amount of water and there are a certain amount of provisions. Here's a life raft and it has a platform that you could actually stand up on to give you a little bit of, of relief from sitting. And along the side, you see all these ropes. And these are absolutely pivotal for men to hang on to. Again, here's another close up on them. So depending on where you went overboard and when, which would decide which group, if any, you would be a part of. As the ship was still moving forward slowly, it took men, men were abandoning over a period of 10 minutes. 
those in the water were in life rafts, floating nets, Cape Ock life preservers, or in many, many cases with nothing on at all. Groups would form with as many as 400 men, mostly swimmers, 200 in rafts and floating nets, to as few as one or two rafts, and then many, many men who were simply alone. They tried to stay together. They would tie the rafts to each other. They would tie the ropes on floating nets or simply lengths of loose ropes just to keep everybody together. They would have the most severely wounded in the middle. The currents were significant. By the time of rescue, some five days later, some groups such as Captain McVeigh's would have drifted as much as 124 miles during the 96 hours in the water. The men in the water faced numerous life-threatening challenges, all of which would become more and more lethal. At the beginning, there was a shred of hope that, hey, they must know we're missing. It can't be too long now. Sooner or later, the planes will spot us. As days were on, hope of rescue diminished sharply. Hope was replaced by dehydration, exposure, hypothermia, dementia, a complete breakdown of rank and discipline and a primal enemy, sharks. There were countless scenes of men trying to aid or encourage their buddies, even though there was little they could do. By Monday morning, the 30th, the sharks began to appear. They'd been trailing many of the groups for almost a day before attacking. Sharks were oceanic white tips, a common ship following type. They were considered very dangerous. Initially, they were to eat the dead bodies floating or sinking to the depths. As time passed, they started to follow groups and attack men either swimming or clinging to the floating nets. Some men were able to fight off sharks. Some men tried to remain perfectly still. It was estimated at a minimum 200 men fell victim to the sharks within the first two days. Exposure was taking its toll. The daytime temperature was about 100 degrees. At night, it dropped to the mid 80s, and this causes the body temperature to drop significantly, leading to hypothermia. That brings on hypoxia, and the end result being amnesia and a general mental stupor. Loss of judgment led to dementia and hallucinations. Men started seeing mirages and illusions, such as, hey, you know what? There's a hotel just down below, or I think I see an island, so maybe 20 yards away, or the water isn't bad, it's not bad. Just don't drink from the top. Reach down and drink from below. Some just said, that's it, I'm getting in the car, I'm gonna go home. There were darker images, which unleashed a horrible threat to the men. Men with knives began to attack each other, attack each other claiming they were Japs or they're trying to kill me. These were men who had been buddies for years. Stark raving men would kill men they had they just went stark crazy. Their men were pushing wounded men off the rafts. In these cases, a total breakdown of discipline. Now to put a stop to the madness, several men banded together and they agreed they would kill any man perceived to be a threat to others. They used a humane method of killing by putting the victim in a headlock and stabbing him below the armpit. A vow was made among them and the witnesses never to divulge their names. Their memory of the deed would haunt them enough for the rest of their lives. And yet these steps certainly saved a number of innocent men. As the day went on, men reacted in different ways. Some resorted to praying aloud and promising to God that they would lead better lives if rescued. Others focused on memories of childhood on the farm, home cooked pies, or sweethearts that were waiting for them. After all, the war was just about over. Another way to cope was to try and encourage your buddy and keep him floating and keep him, keep him from giving up. This worked in some cases, not in others. There was a gunnery officer, his name was Stanley Lipsky. He was very, very well-liked, dedicated officer. He was injured terribly in, uh, during the explosion and the uh, abandoning of ship. He was just, he was blind, he couldn't see. Very, very good friend of Dr. Haynes. He swam, swam up to Dr. Haynes and he said, Lou, I'm dying. Tell my wife I love her. 
she should marry again. And then he's saying to the bottle. And as he <clears throat> as he's saying, somebody started the uh, to recite the 23rd Psalm. Kozel Smith. Kozel Smith was a seaman. He felt something brush up against him, and something grabbed his hand and wouldn't let go. It was a shock, and he's struggling, and he's trying to escape, and he just hitting the shock, and he stuck his, and he felt something, his finger felt something very, very soft, and the shock let him go. What had happened was he stuck his finger in the shark's eye, and the shark let him go. So this is an actual picture. You can see the men in the life raft. You can see some men here. Some men hanging onto the sidelines, and in the bottom of the picture is a shark. So, how did they find them? We know that they were rescued. On the island of Peleliu, there were regular reconnaissance flights over Japanese garrisoned islands that were bypassed on the road to Tokyo. The mission of these recon flights was to prevent resupply or, or evacuation. A second mission was that of uh, the air sea rescue of downed American aviators. I want to go to, <clears throat> this is the Lockheed PV-1 Ventura. This is a plane that would take off on these surveillance flights. Now, because of the distance involved in the Pacific, you needed extremely long antennas or antennas with a long, long transmitting capacity. And what would happen is these planes would take off and they had a cable that would pay, it would come out of the back of the plane and it would trail the plane for, uh, I don't know, I think it was 50 yards or 100 yards. But, and at the end of it was a, was a uh, piece of equipment that would allow them to transmit great, greater distance. The problem was it, was, it was kind of a Rube Goldberg type thing. It worked sometimes and it didn't work other times. So they, this, they take off on uh, August the 2nd. <clears throat> this is Lieutenant Junior Grade Wilbur Gwynn. He's the pilot of the Ventura. They're flying at an altitude of 10,000 feet. They really never look down at the bottom. I mean, they're, it's, everything is uh, controlled by radar. Well, at 10,000 feet, they're flying along and the antenna comes disassembled, uh, disattached, so that they have to bring the cable back in and re-hook re up the, the antenna. What they do is they open the Bombay doors and they're reeling the cable in and they're trying to, trying to fix it up, they're trying to re-hook the antenna. Uh, visibility is terrible, so they go from 10,000 feet to 5,000 feet. And as they're looking down, they're trying to figure out, uh, they're trying to fix it. And somebody, somebody, the, cat, uh, the pilot, Gwen, looks down and he sees what looks like an oil slick on the water. Well, there aren't supposed to be any American ships. There aren't supposed to be, you know, nobody's supposed to be in this area. So their first suspicion is, ah, must have been a Japanese sub or a Japanese ship that sank. So they drop down to get a better look. And they're below a thousand feet and they're just kind of flying out. And all of a sudden they see what looks like a head sticking out of the water. Then a couple of minutes later, they see another five. And within another minute or two, they see another 30 men. So they realize these guys, nobody knows about this, but they, 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 they immediately send a message to Pelu at 11.25 in the morning. They send a second message two minutes later saying there's at least 150 men in the water. This is how the Indianapolis survivors are spotted. Gwynn keeps flying over the area. He drops whatever minuscule supplies he has. He has a life raft, he has a couple life jackets, a, a little bit of water. He wags his wings so that the men know he's been seen. He just wants to stay over there as long as he can because it's the first sign of hope for these men. And he, while he doesn't know where they're from, he knows this is the, he's onto something big. <clears throat> this is a PBY Catalina. Gwen also sends a message 
uh, at two palo and this plane takes off it's it's uh, a pby and the pilot is adrian Marx. he fills the plane up with maximum fuel maximum load of rescue supplies takes off at 12:40, headed for the site the first reaction to all these messages is skeptical skeptical nobody wants to believe the scope of this disaster but it the more news coming in dictates a massive response. Ships and planes are now being diverted to the scene with high priority. One of the first ships to respond was a destroyer escort, the Cecil Doyle. He was a friend of Marx, the pilot of the PBY. He does not wait for orders. He turns his ship and aims it right for the rescue scene. He's got a ship running at 22 knots. The engineering officer says, sir, you got to slow down. We're going to cook the engines. He says, I don't care. We've got men in the water. They estimate the oil slick was about 10 miles long, about five miles wide. At 1230, 150 miles east of the oil slick, another destroyer receives orders to join. She heads out at the top speed of 21 knots. At 215, another destroyer, more and more and more ships. Late in the afternoon, a total of seven ships are en route. In the air, there's numerous aircraft, one of which is the PBY, piloted by Adrian Marx. He arrives at about 4.30. He drops supplies, rafts, waters. He decides to land. This is against regulations. Daylight is fading. Seas are running with 12-foot swells. Wind is at eight knots. He brings the plane down. On the first bounce, she jumps 15 feet. The second bounce and the third are much less. She finally settles. She's got some minor leaks at the seams. Marx figures she will be good for a few hours. They're cruising very, very slowly. They pick up men. They pick up the swimmers. They pick up men who are alone first. If you're in a raft or in a floating net, they bypass you. A lot of the men don't think they're going to be rescued. They're furious. They're swearing. Some of the men are so delusional, they don't want to be rescued. They think that the Japs are there to pick them up. Marx, the pilot, is afraid of running the men over in the darkness. When he completes his rescue mission, he will have rescued 51 men. And, the, and they are on the wings of the plane. They are tied on the wings of the plane by parachute cords. There is no room for anybody else. Another PBY lands, but it can only rescue one uh, one man because of the rough seas. Here's the PBY, this actual picture, another PBY, you see his raft with, with men on it, and, and the seas are pretty, pretty significant. Jesus. The Cecil Doyle, the destroyer escorts running along, <clears throat> flying speed, she's headed to the scene. She has searchlights on them. Manning officer says, turn the searchlight on and aim it direct straight up. That will let men in the water know that help is coming. Another destroyer is there, and they have low, they've got boats lowered and the, 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 the landing craft, and they're going throughout, throughout the area picking men up. And the captain of this one destroyer <coughs> escort was named uh, Terrio, kind of a tough guy. He was a, mer a merchant marina, but he got a Navy commission. Well, he's on the bridge and he hears one of the men who has just seen uh, a shark. This, this man is down below and he's standing at the rail and he says, look at that fish. Well, fish was slang for a torpedo. The captain hears this and he said, that's it. Get all the boats in, we're getting out of here. He wants to stop the rescue. Uh, a junior officer said, sir, we're in a rescue operation. We're not going to leave. He says, I'm the captain. Another junior officer joins uh, the discussion and they escort him to his quarters. That ship, the Bassett, will have rescued the most of anybody in the rescue. She will rescue 151 men. Rescue is going on on the second and the third. Late in the afternoon on the, the third, the rescue turns out to be a recovery of bodies. They had 12 ships in the area. Uh, their log read things like body number 22, no identification, tags, 
no ring, no watch. Body number 20, 28, uh, badly decomposed. They would bury the bodies. And how they would do that, they would put the remains in a uh, piece of canvas. They would put three five inch shells with it and they would close it up and tie it up with two inch hemp and throw it over the, uh, throw it over the side. They would recover 91 bodies. Here are the survivors. They're taken to uh, the island of Guam. Strict orders, you can't reveal anything. Don't say a word. There are newsmen, they're not allowed to say anything. Many of the men, re they, they rescued, rescued 317, but two men died shortly after rescue. Here's a picture of them. They're all on their uh, way back to the States on board the uh, aircraft carrier. This is the, the, uh, one of the destroyers. If you see the, slat, uh, the flat bottom boats, this is the Cecil Doyle. And those boats really uh, made it easy. These men were so weak, they couldn't climb up uh, lines or nets hanging over the side. Here's another destroyer. There's the Doyle. Here's the ring miss. This is the Bassett. <clears throat> the telegrams went out. 800 and, uh, on August 13th, 878 families received telegrams indicating men were missing. This is a telegram that was sent to Commander Haynes' wife. A report just received shows your husband, Lieutenant Commander Haynes, USN, has been wounded in action 30 July. Diagnosis, exhaustion from overexposure, prognosis, good. Your anxiety is appreciated and you will be furnished details when received. You are assured that he's receiving the best possible medical care. I join with you in his wish for his speedy recovery. And then the last line, to prevent possible aid to our enemies, please do not divulge the name of his ship or station unless the general circumstances are made. Letter from the Secretary of the Navy authorized Lincoln, Lieutenant Commander Haynes to wear the uh, this this uh, uh, this award here, Bronze Star Medal. All right, Tinian has the bomb. Indianapolis is sunk. This is what happens next. Here she is. This is uh, the bomb for Nagasaki. This is Hiroshima. The bomb is dropped. Nothing. No reaction from the Japanese. This is Nagasaki. Still no reaction from the Japanese. Here's the Yanola Gay. Finally, August the 15th, US Pacific War has ended. MacArthur to rule Japs. Oh, over here, Indianapolis sunk with 883 men missing. That is the first notification of the ship being sunk. This is not the kind of news Admiral King wants in the headlines. This is not what anybody in high authority wants to deal with because all of America is saying, how the hell can this happen? How can a ship with 1,200 men on it, how can a ship 600 feet long, how can it be sunk with nobody knowing, with nobody even missing her? It's, it's, it's a public outrage. They, the Navy wants to get this off the headlines. August 9th, Nimitz orders a Naval Court of Inquiry to convene at Guam. It's gonna start August 13th. Purpose of the Court of Inquiry, find out what happened, why, and who is responsible. Court would review 43 witnesses and several persons of interest. A person of interest could be anyone not accused of anything, but could be at further notice. So, hence McVeigh wants to become a person of interest. The questioning the court dealt with, the questions were, what were the weather conditions the night of the sinking? Was the ship zigzagging prior to the attack? This is taking place at Guam. Guam is where McVeigh was told nothing to worry about. 
under the, uh, one of the men testifying at Guam, Captain Oliver Naquin, he was in charge of surface operations. And under his command, he said there was no risk, no risk of any Japanese submarines in, that, in the area. Even though they knew about submarine activity, they knew about the wild hunter, they knew about the underworld. And there was even a top secret message of a Japanese group operating in the area. To all of these questions, Nakun goes, no, practically negligible. So the court goes on for a court of inquiry, goes on a week. It focuses its questions on why the Indianapolis was not reported overdue. The court does find fault with some junior officers who responded with answers such as, I knew she was overdue, but since she was reported to another command for training, I didn't act. Or we assume she had arrived, but we didn't check because policy such and such stipulates that arrival of combatant ships shall not be made. Well, if you don't make notice of arrivals, why would you make notice of non-arrivals? Uh, it was just a rat's nest. No, you know, it was a lot of finger pointing. It's still got to be resolved. And what they're honing in on is his failure to zigzag contributed to the loss of the ship. The in Court of Inquiry recommends to Nimitz that McVeigh be tried by a general court martial for culpable inefficiency in the performance of his duty and negligent, negligently endangering the lives of others. King, when he hears this, is ballistic. It's furor and displeasure. He felt the court didn't go deep enough. He felt there should have been far more witnesses. He questioned the route chosen, why no escorts available, who the hell made these decisions. He was also convinced that there were problems with the manner the Indianapolis operated, discipline, organization, training, leadership, all of these things. But he wants to get this out of the public limelight. He writes Secretary of the Navy Forrestal, he says, launch an investigation and have Captain McVeigh tied by a general court martial. McVeigh's court martial. Here's King, tough, tough guy. Nimitz, Secretary Forrestal. Here's McVeigh. Everything is hinging on where it was the ship's executive. Oh, by the way, he was arrested November 29th. Charges against were filed December the 3rd. That gave the defense four days to prepare. In a totally unprecedented step during this court martial, the prosecution called upon Captain Mochizura Hashimoto to testify regarding the fact that the Indianapolis was not zigzagging. They actually brought the captain of the Japanese submarine to Captain McVeigh's court martial. When, when he was interrogated in Japan, and he was, the question was, if he was zigzagging, would it have made it tougher for you to hit him? And his answer was clearly and emphatically, no, I, there was no way I couldn't miss. Translation was very, very clear. When he testified in America, the translation from the American interpreter was less, less lucid, less clear. And it almost ended up, they wore him down. And he said, well, okay, I guess maybe you could, yeah, okay, it might have made a little bit of a difference. Prosecution also carried, called an American submarine commander, Captain Glenn Donahoe, he was a highly decorated commander. And the same situation, Captain Donahoe, if he was zigzagging, would it have made any difference? And numerous times Donahoe goes, no. And they, but they finally keep at him and he goes, well, yeah, maybe because you maybe just before firing a zigzag throws off your calculations. Once he said that, that seals McVeigh's fate. Some of the 19th, he's found guilty of hazarding the ship by failure to zigzag. He will retire, 1949. In his last years, he would suffer bouts of depression driven by letters he would receive from families who lost kin and they blamed their loss on McVeigh. He'd get letters around Christmas and Thanksgiving that would say words to the effect, well, you're probably having a happy Thanksgiving or a Merry Christmas, but we can't because you killed our son. 
and they he would save the ball, he saved the ball, and they just they finally wore him down, and he took his own life. Of note, the entire crew, everybody involved in the crew and the survivors, testified he was fine, he was able, he did nothing wrong, he did in fact get an SOS on. The problem with this is that there were so many people asleep, uh, asleep at the switch that if you can't, if you disciplined everybody, there wouldn't be anybody left. And King just wanted the thing done. He just wanted it out of sight. So he was, uh, he was court-martialed in November of 68. He took his own life, uh, you know, tragically, tragically, uh, unjustly found guilty. Finally, after years, in 2000, October of 2000, House Resolution 48 clears his name. They basically said, yeah, he's innocent. And he was not guilty of, uh, you know, of the crime. Uh, it, was, it was just amazing. He, you know, his career was ruined. But he also all along knew he's a Navy man and what he would do what was good for the Navy. Of the 1,195 men aboard, three out of four died. Out of 81 officers, 67 died. Today, oh, this is a memorial to uh, Lieutenant Thomas Conway. He was the chaplain. Just, just a top guy, wonderful guy. Here is a statue in his honor at his church in Waterbury, Connecticut. Here's the Enola Gay. These, now this was taken maybe three years ago. These were the Indianapolis survivors. That number is definitely diminished now. In 2017, they found her. Here she is at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Here's verification. This is a spare parts package, USS Indianapolis. 35, her hull number. Ship's bell, eight-inch turret, uh, five-inch gun, any aircraft, 40 millimeter any aircraft gun. Uh, she's, I mean, the water is so cold and there's so little, there are so few life forms on there. She's almost in the condition she was 75 years ago. This is 75 years ago, folks. Here's her anchor. And here's a uh, picture taken. And that's my talk. So, so Bob, uh, what? you want to hit stop share or yes, end sir. Share. Hope I didn't go overboard too much. It was well. perfect. Bob, click yep. and share. Hold on. I just hit it. You just hit end share. I hit stop share. Oh, there, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Yay. Thanks, Thank Bob. You. There. Thank you so much, Bob. You're, you're all very welcome. I, I hope I did justice to, to this crew. Well, I think maybe some of the. Um, uh, the guests who are with us can comment on that. We are now ready for our question and answer period. So as a reminder, if you want to speak, please click on participants. It will either be at the bottom or at the top of your screen. Your name should pop up to the top of the list of participants. And click on the menu item, raise hand and that will alert us that there are people here with questions. I'm looking. So for the moment, my mouse is not behaving. So Bob and Jim, will you uh, check please? All right, Norma, Norma Weibel, uh, you raised your hand. So Jim, will you unmute Norma? I just did it. Good, go Norma. Thank you. Um, I want to say thank you to the presenter, of course, because um, it was a phenomenal presentation. 
much of which I had not been aware of. I'm sorry. Um, my father never wanted to talk about it, although he did go to uh, a number of the reunions, and I did too as a as a tween, I guess, in between <laughs> uh, before I was a teenager. And um, he just didn't want to talk about the the terrible things that he went through. And I was too immature to ask. And um, sadly, he's gone now. And I know a lot of the details, but some of them were um, exceptional. And I would love to have a picture of um, the crew that was rescued because I don't have that. Thank you again. Thank you, Norma. We're just so happy that you're here with us. Uh, okay, now let me see. I know uh, Bill Gerber, you asked a question on chat. Where are you? Maybe we need to unmute Bill. Uh, while, while I'm working on unmuting Bill, Libby Ostrovsky, you got your hand up? Go right ahead. Oh, hold on, I was just writing a chat. <laughs> I was going to say, I have items to show from my, my father that was on the Indianapolis. And one of the items that I'm showing actually is a survivor of the Indianapolis. It, it was my father's medical bag, which is issued by the US Navy. And this bag he'd wear, such as going on deck when the kamikaze incident occurred and things like that. And he took that home. When Father Conroy gave him money, he was unable to go home. He, it was three years that he had been home. And when they were in, in, um, at leave, um, Father Conroy asked my father if he was going home. And he said, no, I can't afford it. And I can't afford to have my children, my family come out here. So they actually sent him, he gave him money to go home. And he took this bag home to Fairfield, Connecticut. And he left it by mistake. And so this is a survivor of the Indianapolis itself. Hmm. And so I wanted to show that item. Oh, thank you, Libby. And so, also, let's, so, so Libby, you have an interesting story about uh, the occasion of your birth, I think. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I call myself a delayed reaction. Um, I'm a, pro I'm a, a, a pure, um, example of my father's survival because I was born um, one year after the atom bomb was dropped. I was born August 6th, 1946. And so um, actually I was born late afternoon, late morning and the, atom, and the atom bomb I believe was dropped around 4 a.m. So it's around that time that I was uh, born. But I do have another item that has never been shown in other books and things, which is a picture of men. And um, Maria, I was going to have you post this. And this is a, I don't know if you can see, it's a picture of my father and other individuals at the table of the, um, on his birthday in April before the ship sank. And the names of the men in the back, they all signed it. And um, so it was um, Waybeman, um, Alfred Berthold, R.B. Redmayne, of course, uh, L.J. Siskuk, and E. George, and W.E., and I can't read it, Stinenson. And so uh, I'm going to be giving that to Maria, and so she could post that in case any of the survivors' family want a but that would probably be the last known picture of their family. Of the pictures that um, Bob showed of my dad in on Guam or whatever island he was on, he actually, all those survivors, all the men around him did not survive. Um, he would always be very sad talk showing that. And, um, and it's true, every time somebody died in his group, my father would, because Father Conroy had passed away. And so um, he would, he took over as the coroner because that was the jo doctor's job. And also as the, um, he would say the Lord's Prayer and take away their 
dog tags. And then he would hold on to the dog tags and then the dog tag, and then um, they would let him go. They would take them out of the, um, the, the K-pop jacket initially to save, to dry off the jackets, to save them because they did not know, they, you know, they're wa they get waterlogged within 48 hours. So that was, a that was a major issue. And so they would let them sink away. And uh, Father Conroy actually died in my father's arms. And lipstick that he talked about, he was actually being held by another man who brought him over and couldn't hold on to him any longer. And he, um, as Lipsick was dying and they announcing him that he was going to be dead, the other man disappeared out of nowhere and they never saw him again. And so th those are stories that you live with, that these um, men had to live with all their lives. And one of the stories that dad would say is we'd ask him about the sharks and he never actually experienced anybody being attacked by the shark. The fact is that most of them were swimming around near him. And in one of his um, naval interviews that he has, that I have the, that of, is that he, one shark came close, he tried to grab it because he was so hungry. And the, the, of course he didn't get it, thank goodness. <laughs> but at the same time, at nighttime, while they were trying to rest, he would get, they would get bumped up against by the sharks going underneath. So, I mean, that was, his group didn't really get attacked as much, but they definitely were, um, they were there. They didn't have to feed. They didn't have to attack because everybody would, um, the, they would just waited for their dinner to come, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, it, he, there's, I mean, I could tell you his story. I could read it, the interview part, if you wanted to know about how he uh, survived. But at another time, because but yeah, yeah, but I'm not going to. I am to show Maria. Um, this is a picture of my dad at the Indianapolis um, convention, the reunion they had, and this they actually he saved one of the uh, dog t the tags that they had from one of the reunions in 1980. I think was the last one he went to. My dad did not go to that many because of the fact that. Every time he went, the people would come up. Did you know my father? Did you know my, my family? Did you, did you, did, did you, did he say anything? Do you remember any last words? And those were very difficult for him to remember. And it was very depressing. But also, you know, everybody gets PTSD from all this. And one thing my dad had that followed him throughout his life until the day he died is that if he talked about the ship, which he did a lot, um, and talked about the, the survival and everything. At night, he would tread water and tear the whole bed apart in his sleep. So, I mean, that was something they all probably ended up doing. Wow. Thank you so much, Libby. Uh, now, we've generated a lot of different questions. So, <laughs> Bill Gerber is interested to learn more about the court martial, Bob. And his question is, well, there was a sixth grader who, who did a school paper, as I understand, yeah. that, that led to the exoneration of Captain McVeigh uh, for the loss of the ship. I was wondering if you could say anything about that, if you, if you were familiar with that. Bob? Well, he was, uh, I think, yeah, I've got his name somewhere. He uh, it was like an American civics or American history project. Uh, and what yeah. he did was, I think he kind of rekindled interest amongst the survivors to the point where he was lobbying to, you know, to have another look at uh, the court martial and the court martial proceedings. <clears throat> there was also a, a Navy officer, an Annapolis man, his name was Captain Toti, T-O-T-I. He was commander of the submarine in Indianapolis, and he pled the case for Captain McVeigh also. I mean, right up to the Secretary of the Navy, and uh, there were a lot of attempts made to keep, you know, to, to finally overturn this injustice. Uh, the, the, the junior high school boy, he, I would give, give him a lot of credit for kind of opening the case back up again. 
and he was smart. The kid was, he, he sent correspondence to all of the survivors. The, you know, I, I know of a number of ship, shipmates associations and survivors associations, but the thing about the Indianapolis is these people are like totally dedicated to maintaining and, and protecting and, and you know, and honoring each other. Uh, and it's a very, very active group, I guess, is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. Okay. Um, Phil Cunningham is interested to learn more about the delivery of the atomic bomb. <laughs> His question is, why was the Indianapolis chosen for this mission? I think it was basically, I think she, I think people knew she was a fast ship. She was just coming out of refit. Uh, you know, in, in, I've read about four or five books on it. I, I don't know how she was really chosen. I think it was, okay, well, how are we going to get it there quickly? And, you know, 30, 32 knots easily. Uh, she was in San Francisco. It had to be a capital-sized ship that could do it quickly. Uh, there is a new book out, and it's called 116 Days, and it's from the time Truman takes office until the time the bomb is dropped. I got it for a birthday present. I think that might sh shed some light on it. But I think, I think that why, why the Indianapolis? I think because she was available. Hey, Linda, Bob. Sir? I I just want to mention something. We just got a chat from, uh, I guess, Mr. Bull. It said he said that the young boy's name is Hunter Scott. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, he is now in his thirties. Maria Bullard. He's maybe mm, off the about the sixth grader. That's right. And so he's a Navy officer and a pilot. Oh, he is now. Oh, wow. Good. That's something. Okay, uh, thank you. Arthur's iPad. Our, uh, we have a couple uh, of I'm not sure which one. You're unmuted. What's your question? Well, for Bob, uh, it's with the uh, delivery of the bomb to Tinian, and I was wondering if on a return trip or to wherever the, the Indianapolis was going, whether there were any uh, of the bomb technicians or personnel aboard the Indianapolis. And then when it sank, if they were among the missing as well? I think, the, uh, the, I know there were two army officers on board her mm -hmm. from, uh, you know, from the time she left San Francisco and they, they went on the journey. Uh, I, I think both of them were lost in her sinking. I think, oh no, no, they, I'm sorry, stand corrected. The, I think the two army officers got off at Tinian. There was a friend of Captain McVeigh's uh, who, who hitched a ride basically, but he was lost in the, in the sinking. Could I ask an additional question to the survivors? Go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, it's sort of a frivolous, but on the other hand, I was just wondering, um, did any of them, as you recall, did they have a fear of swimming in the ocean or fear of sharks later in life? Do you know? I know my father didn't. <laughs> that I do know. <laughs> I would think that no one would want to go near the water after that experience. <clears throat> a lot of them didn't talk about it. That's the other factor. Yeah. Maria might know. Thank you. Um, if any of the um, other survivors want to comment, don't forget, go to the participant box and click on raise hand. Um, in the meantime, um, Anne, I don't know your last name, Anne, but your question is, can you say anything about the general reputation in 1945 of the leadership of the Pacific Sea Command Zone. Is that to me? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think, 
you know, obviously some were better than others, but I think as, as an organization, the people in positions of importance, Nimitz, Halsey, uh, Spruance, Oldendorf, yeah. I, th I think the top tier was very, very capable. Uh, and then below them, you know, you want to assume that a lot of the junior officers were capable. But I think what happened is, well, I don't know how to describe this, but basically, here it is, July 1945, it's almost over. And a lot of the vigilance that might have been topside in 42, 43, and even 44 had probably turned into, you know, just kind of, I don't want to say, I don't think people were as vigilant, number one. Number two, there were cases. There was, there was a documented case of uh, somebody receiving a, tele, uh, a message saying that the Indianapolis had sunk, and this was a fairly low-level officer, or even maybe even an enlisted man, and he brought it to the right party who was asleep, and it woke the guy up, and he said, a message for you, and the guy read it, and the, the uh, enlisted man said, any replies? And he said, no, we'll take care of it tomorrow. So there were cases, you know, for, for the rooting officer to say, for the rooting officers officer to say there was no danger or practically negligible with all the other warning flags uh, surfacing within three or four days of the event, that's just out, that's just out and out unacceptable. But I think that there were so many people as you went higher up the chain, a chain uh, command chain that you know it would be tough to discipline everybody that was at fault. They issued four letters of reprimand to relatively junior level officers, all of which were uh, rescinded later on. But, you know, in terms of the top, top tier, I think it was the most powerful Navy in the world. It certainly was unrivaled in terms of capabilities, equipment, or leadership. I would think that for the bulk of it, yeah, it was still, it was good. The, these were people that became complacent, the, lo the lower tier officers. Here's a trivia thing for you. Naquin, Oliver Naquin, the guy that said no danger, the guy that was uh, yeah. in charge of the rooting office in Guam, he had a very storied career. He saw a lot of combat in, uh, in cruises in the Guadalcanal campaign. And before the war, he was the captain of a submarine, which was stuck on the bottom off Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And prior to that, Issue. Prior to that time, there had never been a successful rescue, and there was a rescue of 22 men. So, you know, he, he keeps popping up in naval history. Oliver Naquin. Okay. Uh, Julie Haas, who is um, one of our descendants, uh, wants to speak. Uh, Jim, I am trying to unmute Julie Haas. And uh, okay, let me see. Uh, let me see here, uh, Linda. Uh, Julie Haas. Yeah. I just uh, tried to as well. There, I think it's okay now. So, Julie, what is your question or your comment? Oh, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to comment that I am one of the quite a few of the lost at sea um, remaining people um, that my uncle was. Uh, on the ship, he was a radio man too. And he was in, he participated in all 10 of the battles. Um, two ironic things that our family still has in possession is um, it, was a, it was a sealed tube that came from the Navy to my grandparents that my uncle acquired that gave to my father and the inserts we've been able to pull out um very hard to read but it gives the whole history of the uss indianapolis the battles it's very interesting um we're trying to because it's very inticulated um we're trying to pull it to actually read the whole thing 
Um, the other thing that we have of my uncles, he actually was home um, to visit family and he cut his leave short and asked permission to return to the ship. Um, only kind of funny is he wanted to go see his girlfriend. So he left and then during that time is when they were asked to reboard for this um, yeah. mission that was so secretive. Um, we have quite a other few other little things, but um, it just was a pleasure to be involved and thank you so much. Well, we, yeah. The pleasure is ours that, to have so many of you willing to share all this with us. I think we probably have time for another question or two. Now, um, Norma Weibel, are you asking a uh, fresh question or is that an old raised hand that you've got? <laughs> if you if you want to say something, you're up here with a hand raised. I'm trying to, un there we go. You all set, Norma? He's muted. Maybe she's not here. Okay. Well, I think. Oh, Arthur Daltis, you got another one? Yeah, uh, for Bob. From, uh, question, for, Arthur. Uh, the photos that were shown in the Marianas Trench, uh, there wasn't one showing the uh, torpedo holes on the starboard side. Was, was there a photo of that? Uh, if there was, I'm not aware of it. The, uh, the 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 torpedo hole on the starboard side, the first hit, uh, was you know most of the bow, about sixty five feet of the bow, was actually ripped apart and it mm -hmm. was shifted to the port side, uh, so that that area was open. I think <clears throat> I think that part of the ship actually uh, disintegrated at, w during the sinking. Because in the, those are the only pictures I know of of her. You know, there might be more out there, but the ones I saw, I didn't see any showing the mm -hmm. torpedo hole. Again, that torpedo, you know, they, it was a double explosion within seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, outward, and then secondly, downward, so. Thank you. Uh, I, I actually think we have just one more question. H. Bull, I don't know your first name, I should. Um, I think we've unmuted you, Jim. Give me a hand. Yeah. He's unmuted. He's unmuted. He, he. Do you have a final question for us, Mr. Bull? Um, hi, this is Maria Bullard. Um, my father was a survivor, and I guess I had raised my hand earlier when the question was Did my father have a problem with water or swimming or anything? And um, he actually did not, and he loved to swim afterwards, which was very interesting to me. And, um, but he, he didn't, he, he enjoyed swimming. And um, I guess the only other question that I was gonna answer was the question about um, when the bomb was, escort, when the bomb was brought over, did any one escort the bomb at the time? And I mentioned it in the chat. There was, there were two scientists actually, two people that were on board. I, I looked up the information, so I'm gonna read it to you so that I don't get it wrong. One I knew was Robert Furman, and um, he was the scientist. It said, um, in July 1945, Furman personally escorted half of the um, uranium necessary for little boy on the um, Indian. And he, it says he accompanied, was accompanied by Captain James Nolan, a radiologist with Project Alberta. And Furman set out by car from Santa Fe to Albuquerque. And then he traveled to the airfield in California and both of those men did board the Indianapolis and to, went on the mission over to Tinian to deliver the bomb, but they both did get off at Tinian. So um, they were the ones that were instrumental in um, building the bomb and developing it, but they did get off at Tinian. So that was um, the answer to that. And then someone else was asking the name of the church in Waterbury that they have the memorial to Father Conway and that's the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. Well, we cannot thank Bob Biggin enough for yes. 
just wanting to tell this story and for doing the huge amount of research that he did, Bob, it was wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you for thank you and your team for guiding me through this. You're an expert now. No, I don't know. <laughs> huge thanks to you, Bob, for telling the story for these of these heroes. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, ma'am. And survivors from all over the country. I mean, descendants of survivors. Thank you for honoring us with your presence today. It was simply grand, and uh, it really enriched everything that uh, that we had to say. So I think that ends our uh, program for today. Remember, if you want to get in touch with James Ramsey, it's jamesrams at verizon.net. You're interested in donating some blank audio cartridges to the Bedford veterans. Okay, we will, you'll be hearing from us in a couple of weeks with details about our August program and our fall schedule. Thank you for your support. This ends our program. Goodbye, everyone.